Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where today's most exciting startup founders share their stories and strategies. They also deliver tangible lessons learned along the way that you can apply to your own startup. Each episode is a true masterclass. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. This is Kevin Pruitt with another episode of Rising Tide Startups. And my special guest today is Daniel Lane. Daniel, thanks for joining us all the way from the motherland. Thanks for having me, Kevin. It's a real pleasure to be here. We've, uh, we've had a quick little chat. He's actually sitting in a, 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 just a lovely little borough in England called Bedford, that uh, one that I've actually visited once or twice. And I'm kind of jealous because uh, I, I missed my time that we, we spent in the UK. But Daniel, can you just share a little bit of your background with our listeners today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was born just down the road from Bedford, actually, in a place called Milton Keynes yeah. in the late 70s. I've been programming since I was about nine, started on the ZX Spectrum, Commodore 64, Archimedes, <laughs> um, but took me a little bit longer to become a professional programmer, uh, about 20 years old. And I spent my first jobs working on uh, payment cards. So I did some work on chip and pin before uh, contactless came about and displaced it, and also ATM networks. And then after that, I moved myself to London, as people tend to do at that age, uh, worked for an advertising buying agency, writing some really curious software to analyze buying spends in Excel. Um, and then I got my first taste of the startup world in the uh, late 90s dot com boom, working for an e-commerce platform, uh, which was technically pretty amazing. Uh, although it did have to use Flash at that time because kind of web 2.0 technologies weren't out. Yeah. Um, but it was a victim of being way too early for the market. So they built some amazing tech, spent a lot of money, um, and really didn't sell any of it. But uh, just goes to show you, um, you know, you can have the best idea, but it's all about is the market ready yeah, for you? Yeah, the timing. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so, so many things. Kind of that, that happened, I think, in the dot-com boom that fit that description. You know, they, they were too early. Yeah. They were, or they Absolutely. were too late either. either. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Go on, yeah. Yeah, so that kind of um, then takes me up to how I got into this industry. So we uh, work in the asset finance uh, industry, also known as equipment finance. And I fell into it completely by accident. I'd met someone on another job and they said, oh, come and work me on this project. It's really interesting. And that was uh, probably 2000, 2001. And yeah, I've been here ever since. So started off uh, working primarily on motor finance platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you go into a car dealership and uh, take finance out, which 90% of people do, then I would write the systems which took those applications, processed them, produced all the documentation and things like that, and then got into leasing and asset finance more broadly out of that, became a bit of a kind of business consultant as well as a technologist, and then started QB Systems initially in 2012. So QV Systems, was it primarily in the auto industry specifically, or when you talk about equipment finance, could it be virtually anything that, that a business would need to finance that would, might fall under the, the term equipment? Absolutely. So we cover everything from automotive, and that, that was where I spent most of my time. So that was a big part of it. Uh, but also general equipment, so laptops, agricultural equipment, kitchen refits, um, print presses, industrial machinery, anything that a business might want um, can generally be, be financed. Um, and that goes all the way from a single thousand pound laptop to a Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Yeah. Very different transactions, but the same principles apply. And that's what our software does. So are you the middle person between kind of the the sales force or the finance, you know, I guess, guy and the and the the lending company? 
are you are you kind of that that connection piece or do you work across multiple lenders so we we don't get involved in the actual financial transaction itself so we have no um capital that we deploy right. or anything like that we don't take cuts of these transactions right. what we provide is the platform that people can use to get that business done on yeah so um you know a lot of these businesses uh have a lot of very old software maybe no software at all maybe it's in excel and word and email um and there are options out there. Obviously, you can go and choose yourself a generic um, CRM, something like Salesforce, something like Microsoft Dynamics. But that then requires a lot of customization to make it fit this industry. Um, so what we do is we've done all of that work. We understand the industry. We understand the um, data that needs to be manipulated as part of mm -hmm. these transactions. And we've built a SaaS platform that gives you the same kind of experience as a salesforce.com, but specifically for asset, automotive, and broader commercial finance. Right. I essentially, my uh, my son used to be a finance manager at an auto dealership. And so I'm sure that he's dealt with, you know, kind of the same, you know, software in the same space, but it is, it is really Absolutely. interesting. So this, this whole idea kind of around the, the banking industry, I mean, I've got a good friend in the UK that is in uh, like property management and finance. And he said that when they tried to expand from say Europe to the U S they found that the U S banking system was almost archaic, you know, compared mm -hmm. to compared to what the UK, what the UK was or Germany or, or even France and, and the rest of the countries in the, in Europe. But that, that really was surprising because you think, you know, there, there's so much technology that's cutting edge here, yet that yeah. specific industry seems to be like, you know, we're still operating on like Excel spreadsheets and duct tape or something. <laughs> <laughs> so how have you uh, found the, that? You found that to be true? It's so strange because um, I'm definitely not an, an expert in banking systems generally. I wouldn't claim that. but I've used um, retail banking software as a user. Mm -hmm. um, I've used specialist software to deal with card payment transactions as a user and cash machine networks. Um, and I've used a lot of software in the industry that we, we now operate in. And it's such a strange mixture of really, really cutting edge technology at one point in the journey backing into stuff that's like 40 years old mm, yeah and like you say it's a real hodgepodge and i know it's particularly complex in america because of the federal nature mm -hmm. of the country yeah. and um the banking standards have evolved differently in different places but yeah even in the uk you know you can you as a consumer can be doing something on your fantastic mobile app that your bank has provided you or a, or a, ne a neo lender or neo bank but i would bet a significant amount of money at some point that data is going into a system that's written in cobol <laughs> yeah it's uh, it predates windows 95 that's for sure <laughs> oh yes oh yes absolutely Nice. So, so tell me, like, nobody just wakes up and decides, you know, I'm going to go into equipment leasing software. I mean, you kind of walked through the, you know, maybe the journey heading into that space, but that that's a that's a pretty big bite, you know, of the apple to take on. I mean, as an individual, did you have, you know, kind of a group of you that that decided to kind of take this on, or did you just say, hey, I, I'm going to go for it. I can, I can hire people when I need to. I'm going to go raise some money out there and. What was the what was that that light bulb epiphany moment that kind of kind of walked you into this space? Well, I I, I tell you this, Kevin. I wish it had been as well planned as that. <laughs> <laughs> but any anyone anyone that knows me will tell you that planning is not my forte. <laughs> so I was a I was a pretty serious technologist. You know, my speciality was data modeling. Mm -hmm. So designing the data models that supported these platforms 
pretty nerdy stuff, really. Um, but one of the where it really came from is so I would spend my time working on these projects, which would last anything from eighteen months to two years, give or take. Uh, so we would write the software. You know, if it was abroad, we'd get on the plane, we'd fly out, see the customer, install the software. Because of course, this is you know this is not the modern world that we're in now. Uh, so you just have to take it on the CDs. Um, and then it would, you'd get to a point where the customer was happy, you'd go live, and then you'd go back to the UK, the office in the UK and you'd start again. You'd do the same <laughs> thing again. And after a few goes round, fun though it was, I just thought... He says that tongue-in-cheek, <laughs> fun or <laughs> <was. laughs> There has to be a better way, right? There has to be a way that we can build this software once, deploy it over the cloud. I mean, the cloud was kind of a thing back then, but it wasn't if you wanted to sell it to a bank. Banks were still like, no, that's not a thing. Yep. It's on our metal in yep. our basement. I want it's not to safe, touch not it. secure. Yeah. Too many open doors. Yeah. Yada, yada, yada. Exactly. <clears throat> and and basically, I just started writing the software as a technology experiment. There was no business model. I had no idea how I was going to commercialize it. I had no idea what the total addressable market was or even what that phrase meant. <laughs> um, but what I did have is a conviction that there, there needed to be a better way of delivering this service. So... I wrote uh, a bit of it, you know, a bit of a prototype, if you like, and took that to some of the existing uh, software vendors in this space, including, you know, the person that owned the company I worked for. And I'll always remember him saying to me, uh, okay, you know, I like it. It looks cool, but how are you going to make money from it? How do we commercialize this? And of course, I had... I didn't have the answer. Um, and then the global financial crash mm -hmm. happened and everybody kind of retreated into their shells and, and, and had to deal with that. You're talking 2008? Yeah, 2007, 2008. Yeah. Um, and then, so I kind of parked the software. Mm -hmm. I had to go to work. Um, I had my first child by that point, so doing all of that as well. Um, but then in kind of 2011, I thought there must, you know, there's something there. And it seems like a real shame to leave that software on the digital shelf. So I dusted it off, managed to raise some angel money um, and set to work on trying to turn it from a prototype into a product. I bet you knew what uh, Tam was when you talked to your first angel. Because <laughs> he asked you the question, he goes, what's the TAM you have? I, I already know what TAM means. Oh, total addressable market. Oh, oh yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go find that out. And I'll come back. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say this. Um, the angel uh, was great. And, you know, without their faith and support, we wouldn't be here. So, you know, thank you, Simon, for that is his name. <laughs> um, but the real learning curve was when we did our first VC round and that's when you realize how little you know <laughs> because they don't the mind acronym... letting you know that either do they <laughs> no no they're not shy about about telling you that <laughs> perhaps you should have done a bit more homework before you walked into their office um but that's when you that's when I really started I suppose my education in what it takes to build a business rather than what it takes to build a product mm. that's a great distinction very different <clears throat> yeah that is like that's a great distinction i i uh i want to drill down on that in just a moment but i i'm really curious though you know say let's let's look at launch of, of qv systems and then maybe just walk a you know kind of the quick journey from then to today what's been the progression yeah, sure. um yeah so got the angel money got it to us got the product to a place where i thought okay this this is um credible i can show this to people and 
yes, it's not a finished thing. Yes, it's not been in development for 20 years, but it makes some kind of sense. And then another lesson, you cannot sell software to large financial institutions as a three-person startup because you do not pass their due diligence requirements. Yep. Yep. They know that. Mm-hmm. They don't even bother. So we had to do a, a bit of a, a pivot, you know, away from the blue chips that I was used to dealing with in my previous career. And we, and we you know, thought, well, where else in the market can we go? And where we ended up was with the broker or introducer, depending on your terminology, market. And these people were completely unserved because they were too small for the, the big software vendors to worry about. That they really were just Excel, you know, standard desktop productivity software right. suites, bits of paper, you know, Post-it all notes. of that stuff. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> absolutely so we we got our foothold there and we we i like to think you know we were instrumental in actually creating that market mm-hmm. in the uk the market for a proper system for um auto finance brokers you would have done i mean if it didn't exist i mean and and it does now i mean i yeah. think you would have created that yeah so so we did that for three years or so and that got us to a stage where we were actually able to win a contract with a pretty decent sized uh, finance company that did auto finance Mm -hmm. and asset finance as well and that then um, drove us into making sure that the platform worked equally well for both and and they were doing more on the platform than the brokers were, because obviously brokers don't need to do underwriting. It's really mm-hmm. the distinction. These people needed to do underwriting. So we had to integrate with credit reference agencies, provide screens to do all of that on, more advanced workflows, more advanced e-signature. Um, and really that contract got us to the size where we could then go for the VC money. Mm. The VC money then took us from um, I think we were probably five people uh, when we won that contract, four or five, um, and now we are 21 at the moment. Um, and the business has almost exactly quadrupled in size across those four years. Um, so a really strong growth story, and we're super excited about what comes next and just now scratching the surface i mean you're it sounds like to me you're almost you you would consider we're almost getting our feet under us you know type type stage you know we're like we've kind of moved from the startup phase to kind of now we're at scale you know let's uh we we keep seeing this you know four times growth you know every year and and i mean that's that's not sustainable over 50 years but it's, it's certainly no, you know, early early not. days. I mean, <laughs> yeah, even if you go down to we're, we're doubling every year, but if you're big, you know, it's a it's a that's yeah, a nice jump. But of course, it's a nice of jump. Course. But so lessons learned in that short period of time. What are some what are some things that just come to mind? I mean, just as a founder, you know, just yeah, you know, I I love the phrase that you used earlier. You said, you know, we we move from being a product to a business. You know, yeah, maybe talk about that a little bit and and how you grew maybe in that process. Oh, definitely. So, I mean, my uh, advice would be spend less time on the product, more time on product market fit. Mm. So uh, a really great example of this, one one of our developers um, who previously worked in automotive retail uh, came to me with what on the surface seems like a really good idea. Um, and he took me through how it was all going to work and what the screens would look like and what the functionality was. And I said, well, hang on a minute. How are you going to sell it? Who pays for this? Who's the customer? What their pain points? What pain points are you solving? 
how much is it worth how much are you going to charge and you know what are you going to need to run this business and those are the questions that you need to to answer and i think if you're a person who like me is so excited about building things creating things you can just go straight down that rabbit hole um you know there's still features in this product by the way in our product that have never been used by a paying customer that i built because i thought that they were cool <laughs> and that might be fun and if you want to do that in your in your spare time you go for it but that's not how you build an efficient business um that would absolutely be um a, a point of advice for anyone that's that's about to start that journey yeah regardless uh, of whatever the industry is i mean just yeah. about any any industry yeah yeah absolutely and and you don't have to do what i did which is start um something in an industry that you are an expert in because uh you know i'm fortunate in that the thing i was an expert in can support a decent sized company mm -hmm. i mean we're never going to be a massive company because the market just isn't there so if you're thinking like a business person you would do it the other way around mm -hmm. you, know, you would say what can i solve that has the largest possible addressable market that i can you know i've got some knowledge of um uh, or i've got a great idea for it or i can find people who've got great ideas for it um and then i can go and i can build that and if i get 0.1% of that market yep. it's massive yep so that's that's probably um the key piece of advice that i would give um uh, don't forget to think about the business. I I I love it how concise you were and that you didn't have to think about it. You just said this is the this is the 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 main lesson. The main lesson is spend more time on product market fit, less time on just creating the product itself. What about what about lessons that you learn going from being an employee or a consultant to now being the boss? Did you, did you take away, like, I mean, I look at my own, you know, journey and I'm looking back and I've had good bosses. I've had bad bosses. I've learned as much from the bad ones as I've learned from the good ones sometimes about what not to do, you know? So how would you, how would you characterize your own transition or growth in that space? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's really difficult. Should I ask the other 20 people working with a QV systems? <laughs> <laughs> no, please don't. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> this is your show, luckily, not theirs. That's right. Luckily, <laughs> luckily it's half past nine at night. Here, so they're not in the office. That <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's really, really hard. And like anything, you know, I'm, there will be people who've got a natural aptitude for it, people that shouldn't ever do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, if everyone else is kind of on the spectrum somewhere between those two extremes um it's very difficult when you suddenly realize that you're responsible for people's mortgages uh you know it's up to you to pay people at the at the start at the end of the month you know i'm fortunate now that we're big enough that somebody else actually pays people and, and does it in a much more efficient way than i ever did but <laughs> As an employee, you know, when I was 19 working at um, the bank, I had no idea how I was paid. The money just appeared in my account. As it's just the magic. money fairy just yeah. gave me just, money. <laughs> there it is. But, you know, when, when you're a founder of a small company and you don't have a finance team, yeah. it's you transferring the money from the company bank account manually. Every, and there were, there were times when I would forget. And I'd wake up the next morning and look at my watch and go, oh, my God, it's the first of the month. I forgot <laughs> to pay everyone. Um, so there's that. There's the responsibility. There's the fact that you can never switch off. Mm. So you will be thinking about it 24-7. Yep. Um, and that's very different to being an employee. Um, and the other thing I would say is 
you see companies from the outside um, as even as an employee unless you're very very senior right you see the marketing you see what the executive team want you to see uh, and if you're in a big corporate of course there's an entire department of people to deal with internal communications and making sure that everything looks amazing but um, under the hood you know that's where the real work is and that's where you've got people stressed out burnt out crying but also you know exhilarated excited engaged uh, fascinated driven because there's nothing like creating something from nothing mm. you know and it doesn't yeah. have to be soft it doesn't have to be software it could be anything you know mm -hmm. a food truck um, a new shoe company but the biggest thrill that I get is if I walk into a customer and see that software running on 20 or 40 or 100 monitors and you know to know that that's something that our team here has built is is amazing so the, the the pain is real the lows are real but the highs are also amazing the pain is real and the gain is real the uh yeah absolutely yeah. i like that uh, yeah that's so now I, you got to really be adept at listening to our friend daniel here i mean he's very eclectic he's globally eclectic because he used the term under the hood he didn't say under the bonnet I mean, he, <laughs> he, he's been reading some American business books or something as well. So he can, he can translate and speak the language, but, uh, man, that is, that is so good. Um, just, I, and so real and raw, you know, it just, you're the way you express that as a, as a founder, you know, you, you're on 24 seven, you know, I, I woke up and I'm responsible for paying people. I, I forgot to pay them. So I'm paying them the first thing tomorrow morning, you know, to make sure that's taken care of. And just the the realities of of it, what it's like to to be the the boss and the one responsible, the, the responsible party for, yeah. for making sure all that happens. But where do you uh where do you envision QV systems going? You say in the next, you know, two to three years, maybe three to five, whatever. What's that, what's that upward ride hockey stick look like? Yes. Um, so we are we're we're on a mission, and that mission is uh, frictionless finance. So there's still too much friction in um, certainly the commercial finance landscape in the UK. Mm -hmm. Globally, <laughs> we, yeah, absolutely. But we'll tackle that later, right? We'll do the UK <laughs> first before we before we get too big for our boots. But but. You know, people rekeying data, um, people having to manually provide proof of identity, proof of mm -hmm. address, proof of address, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. Um, and you know, each individual improvement that we can make is small, but we feel when we've made enough of those improvements, you know, that could be a real step change in in how the whole economy, the credit economy works and what that can do not only for individuals because who doesn't like a, a, an easy uh, experience when they're trying to buy a product yeah, sure. whether it's finance insurance whatever but also for businesses because you know we've just been talking for the last 20 minutes about how hard it is to start a business so why would we make it any harder than it is already mm. you know you you've got a great idea for a new coffee shop why do we make it any harder for that person to realize their idea than it need be? So let's make business finance as smooth as consumer finance um, already is. Um, and then let's connect all the different counterparties in this industry so that they're sharing data, trading, um, you know, exchanging information in a seamless frictionless way that's right. our vision right and that's going to take a long time but the next three to five years i feel we've now got the organizational maturity um, we've got the product we've got the drive and the will to, to really start making inroads into that and that's what we're going to do i um i mean i love the vision 
I mean, the one, the one question I have in that vision is like, you know, to say you want to make it frictionless is a great, um, it's a great goal, but every party in that process has to like play their part in that as well. Every, you know, every, doesn't matter if you're the third supplier, the first, first in the, in the bucket, whatever. And not only, you know, reducing friction, it is reducing friction in a very secure manner because yeah. there's nothing more susceptible than like financial transactions, you know, and the, the whole financial space as far as, and, and information, you know, uh, integrity that, you know, you're trying to maintain. So it's a, it's a big, big ask and a big task. I mean, it's, uh, I, I applaud you for certainly taking that on. It's not like, you know, selling t-shirts on, on Etsy or something. It's a, it is a <laughs> much, much bigger task, but I'd, I'd love for you to wrap us up today. Just, just speak into the camera and just, you're talking to people that are sitting in a cube. They've got their ideas. They, they're trying to, you know, how, how do I launch it? How do I take that first step? How do I step out in faith? How do I, you know, all the above the, the things that you went through, you know, in, to, to launch QV systems and just, just real concisely, just, just speak to them to, to give them a word of advice, encouragement, whatever you think would be the most helpful. And then, then tell people where the best place to find you online. Sure. So I think I would say you don't have to quit your job and go all in, right? If you're 21 and you've got no responsibilities and you don't pay rent, fine. And that's what you want to do. And you think, you know, I can do this. I'm going to go for it. That's fine because if it doesn't work, it's not a problem, right? You mm. go and get another job. Yeah. If you're not in that in that situation, you don't have to quit and go all in. You what you do have to do is do the research and the thinking up front mm. because you can save yourself so much time by doing that. And if I were to do this again, you know, that's what I would do. I would do more upfront work on the business which would save immeasurable amounts of time later on. So I would say if you're in your cube and you've got a great idea, especially if it's B2B, because the great thing about selling to businesses is if it saves the money or improves their workflow, they'll buy it. Yep. If you're selling to consumers, you've got to appeal to emotion. You've got mm. to have a massive marketing budget, all of that stuff. Um, so if you've got a good B2B idea, go out there, speak to prospective customers, validate your thoughts on what their pain is and how you could solve that, and then get building. You know, you don't have to be a software engineer to build great solutions nowadays. You know, you don't even have to hire software engineers. It's about using your intellect to solve a problem and, and there are so many tools out there, no code, low code tools mm -hmm. that can do that for you. Um, get yourself some paying customers, see what happens, see if you like it. You know, do you like running a company? Do you like having that responsibility? And if you don't like it, don't do it because it's <laughs> really, really stressful. <laughs> that is so true. That is so true, man. Thank you. Thank you for taking that time. Where's the where's the best place for them to find you online or find out more about QB Systems? Sure. So um, our website is just qv.systems. Um, I'm Daniel Lane and Lane is L-A-Y-N-E. I'm on LinkedIn and our email address is just... Uh, forename.surname at qv.systems. So you can email me directly there. Daniel, thank you so much for just taking time. And, and he, hey, guys, he stayed late on a Friday evening to uh, to talk to Rising Tide, to talk to our, our listeners across the globe. And and uh, man, I just really appreciate you taking the time to share your story and and share your wisdom, you know, of, in, that you have, have garnered in this kind of journey, this serendipitous journey you've taken, you know, over the years to arrive where you are today. But mostly just uh, committing to playing your part and helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Daniel, have a great weekend and thanks again. Brilliant. Thanks, Kevin. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks for having me. Another episode in the books. We hope you heard some great takeaways. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review on iTunes and YouTube. 
As always, thanks for listening to Rising Tide.